Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. So I have two motherboards here. We are working on the Pentium 2 system, so this is the part 2 of that. And my plan was to work on the CPU and also add a fan and uh, some extra caps to this graphics card here, the TNT, that the system originally had, so that someone replaced. So I actually was kind enough to donate this broken one. And uh, the weird thing was though, he said it didn't work, he didn't post for him, he had an identical one that posted. When I tried this in my lab board here, which is a socket 370 with a pension tree and a universal ADP slot, it did work. But there was a lot of damage to missing SMD caps on the back, ceramic ones, and yeah. And we assumed that might be bad caps on the front here, the electrolyte. So we did a full recap, added back what was missing on the back, and it works just fine. I can run, I actually run it for like 24 7, even with overclocking, just like Quake 2 running, 3 Mark 2000 running, just read fine. So I decided before I started filming. Now, test this card in here just to make sure it posts. Well, it kind of posts, but there's no video output. So I decided to try this card again in this motherboard. No problem, it just works fine. So I tried another two motherboards, I'm not gonna get them up here because they're insistent and such. But the same thing there. It seems to post no VDA peep except on one board, separate board I tested. But the other two systems, they just post, but no image. So uh, I actually ran two cards in this one. This card here and an ISA card. And uh, had bo lines put up and it says this card exists. I could even run headless basically with this card in it and would say it's there working. So there's something weird with this card. And the only clue I have is that uh, there might be a headline crank or ball too from the bottom left. I gone over everything, like the sisters and stuff. I can't find anything. I compared images, values, measured. So there is something broken with this card, and it kind of explains now why it worked or didn't work for Axel in his computer. Because as far as I can test, this is done on motherboard for me. It actually works. It just happened to be the motherboard that I use for testing, which is Murphy's Law. Murphy is very much into retro computing, it seems. So this card needs to go back into the pile of, I need to fix it. And uh, because I think it needs a uh, reballing at the very least, maybe because I can't find anything else to suspect other than what looks like a crack. Uh, Axel has told me though, he sent over another TNT, but it lacks the four menu chips on the top. Uh, actually eight megabyte versions that are 64 bit wide, so they're gonna be really, really slow. Not like, only like in memory, but really slow. So, and that probably has to be its own video trying to upgrade that, because I do have memory chips for the, the cards like this. So instead I tested this card, because it uh, has a new GPU. A new, but I don't have a GPU for another other broken bench in that someone damaged the PCB. And on this one I damaged the GPU by using a screwdriver to crack uh, the heatsink off and took all the metal parts. But this is tested working also in this motherboard, but also I know it posts in this one. Benchmark it before. This should be a perfectly good card, new heatsink and fan and everything. And it's very similar in performance to the TNT. It's, a, it's the same year, which I'm trying to go for 98 here. So yeah, that will be what we're gonna use instead. So in this video, I want to take this t Pension 2 apart. And uh, replace it and uh, send kind of some thermal pads to the uh, cache ships. And then uh, remove this stock. Uh, Semi riveted uh, slash screwed in uh, heatsink and replace it with uh, another one with a standard fan, 50 millimeter fan. So we can actually swap the fan because this this fan is horrible, so it makes a lot of noise. So, yeah, let's get cracking and start to uh, remove this Pentium 2 here. Before we remove the CPU here, I'm gonna remove the RAM here. I figure we upgrade the RAM anyway, it's 128 megabyte, it's fine, but. Uh, yeah, I think it swaps too much with 128 megabyte. Plus, we can. If we're gonna try some overclocking, we probably want some PC 133, and this is just PC 100. I do have some PC 125, that might also be a good drop in. Uh, someone has put a lot of glue on everything in the system here. So, I personally do think slot 1 is extremely over engineered. Cannot have been that cheap. I do get why they want external cache. But if you look at uh, like Apple, they would still use a socket and just have the basically a PCB with the extra cache and CPU being face down. They also put the VRM on that and that you can argue if that makes sense or not. But I think they had a better idea that way. So yeah, there's a lot of over engineering going on here. So we've got this 
like studs coming up here and that supposed that only fits the stock cooler so I assume that came with the CPU I'm not sure so if I can get the CPU out of him It's not the easiest thing to remove for some reason, it really gets stuck in there. But yeah, that's the whole CPU assembly. So someone has been putting glue on everything everywhere, including this CPU here. I really didn't want these pieces to fall apart during shipping or something, I guess. A lot of hot snot glue. Yes, it's good that it's really cold inside now. I haven't turned up the heat to 16 centigrades. So, quite cold. Slight minus 14 outside here in Sweden, but the south part of Sweden, I think it's like 30, 40 minus in the northern parts. So there are holes here, so you could technically move the heat sink from here, I think now, if you really wanted to. I don't know if this one will fit, I don't think so. It are basically hex screws. They look like rivets, and I might actually like people say be riveted because uh, they're basically like a pipe. So you get the hex uh, through the pipe. So and the pipe is uh, turned on the outside, and then it's uh, like stamped on the top here like a rivet. So you should be able to screw it out, but they have a tendency to strip uh, from what I read, and I don't remember how I got these out back in the day. If I screw them out or drill them out, a lot of people drill them out thing is if you put something like this in and uh, you push it too far you can hit the PCB you don't want to do that but let's have a look down in this uh, NES more or less cassette here over here I got the external L2 cache as you can see I can slide this thing freely between the cache and the indentations that's supposed to touch the cache I guess Intel were like yeah we need to cool the cache and then we decided we not gonna cool the cache actually read about this in our, on our Discord because people are overclocking and uh, tweaking Quake 2 and stuff and they're running Pension 2s and Pension 3s and apparently this is uh, fairly common. So you might think the cache is actually cool when you take it apart and you see those and like yeah they're touching the cache. Well uh, at least on mine it's not and it's apparently not only mine. So this is one reason I want to take it apart also replace the turn paste here. We had some people on our Discord noticing that their old Pension 2s are actually throttling with the stock cooler and everything. And after I repaced, they didn't. Uh, I don't remember how the Pension 2 throttling works, so I, but I think it's kind of like clock skips or something. So the frequency will be probably be the same. It just doesn't do anything every clock if it runs too hot. This is like an IHS, like on your modern CPU. So let's take something not so modern, but yeah, you get the idea. So this IHS is en enormous because it's supposed to cool the cache and the CPU. And on top of that, you have the heatsink. So the, the dividing line there is uh, the difference. And uh, this uh, HS is held on with two clips of four studs. You can see one there, one over there. And it's gonna be two on the other side, somewhere around here. But there are actually like eight studs. Uh, you can see one there and one there. Those are actually holding this plastic case on. So this plastic case is held on here, here. And here and here, and it's pressed on. So you can uh, kind of have to use some force to get it off. So, yeah, that's the plan. Take this apart, and I haven't done that in like 20 years, something like that, and it over 20 years. So, this plastic case, they are, can be quite difficult to get off. This corner here, for example, is a little bit loose already. I've been feeling around here. So, they basically recommend start where it's the easiest and work your way around. And you don't want to bend against the PCB, so you want to, since the IHS is what holds the plastic on, you want to apply force between those two surfaces here, where they basically meet here. But you basically have to start with a smaller screwdriver and work your way up. And yeah, that corner is coming off easily enough. These things aren't the easiest things to get apart, for sure. And they will leave marks, certainly. But we'll have to live with that, I think. I 
think we finally have it and uh, yeah, that took way much way too much force for my liking that's for sure yeah the stubborn one over here really had um, a bite that's for sure just looking at the metal it's uh, a lot more sharp than this side here so knowing that i probably wouldn't have taken this thing apart knowing how stuck this particular one was so that's that one i'm just gonna clean up all these parts a little bit from marks and stuff extremely sturdy so it's not bad Yeah, so it's kind of hard to get into these things without making a dent. And I suspect I was a little bit unlucky with how stuck this thing was on this particular CPU. And I marked on that one because that was the easy side. So it actually looks like those holes are oval, those are round, and the stucky side is, yeah. So it's the way it seems to be. That one side is actually more attached to another one, kind of annoying. So yeah, I'm just cleaning this up a little bit here. So yeah, you can actually see the marks here in the aluminium, because aluminium tends to be soft, especially if it's pure for conductive reasons you usually have pour. So almost no marks on this side, and this was the annoying side. And like I said, you want to avoid the, the circuit board, so to speak. So these ones are the ones that holds the plastic cover in place. So it's really not serviceable. Now, the next problem is these clips are also not intended to be removed. So you have your uh, clips here, spring loaded. When they're pushed on, they will lock in uh, on that head there. So to remove them, you have to basically bend uh, these up a little bit. Like I've done this before, but it was 20 years ago, I have forgotten everything. You need some persuasion. Yep. Well, the CPU actually looks fine. So that is the Pentium 2 and the heatsink. So here is the for cooling for the cache, which is uh, so it goes on like that. But it's actually no pass, no nothing. So, so the idea now is just to clean all this up. I'm going to remove the marks here and the paste and everything. And yeah, and then we're going to see what kind of pads we can put here. Because we don't want to put two thick pads, so the whole thing goes like, whoops. Plus, I think we would put some pads here, corresponding to here, just to make sure that it's e evenly high, like when, when these cash chips touch here with the pads, this one is also touching here with the pad, just to even things out to make sure. And that needs to not be so high that the die is floating. So that's the plan. I did clean up the heatsink a little bit. I just took a file to the edge here and then a marker pen. So. It looks nice, but we're not going to see it anyway later, but uh, yeah, I just like things to look nice. And this edge here is not going to look nice ever, I think, again. But uh, what I did after I just removed like, the, the burr, uh, most of it, is I took a Q-tip with a little bit of acetone, just to make it glossy again. So yeah, that's it for this one. But like I said, it's going to go the race on the motherboard goes here. On the motherboard here, so when this goes into here, you're never really gonna see that anyway. So these are the screws, and yeah, you could remove it like that, especially if you have a decent uh, tool. If you're using something that can be too long, 
Uh, so you go in here through them from the other side here. You could come out on this side here. We can actually see where those spots are. Because we've got dust here, here, here and uh, over here. So you could hit the PCB. It's quite easy I think to strip these because they're very thin metal since the basically got two, but we're gonna try to get them out. So I think I'm gonna do it from this side. It's gonna be easy to see, I think. But I can't screw them out, I have to drill them out. I don't know why they didn't use normal screws, but uh, this is what they used. Yeah, they're already stuck. And you have to think the opposite way now when you're doing them this way. So there I think it went. Yep, so it's coming out there. Yeah. I'm gonna do all of them before. So you could opt for this if you have a good uh, driver. You do this from the outside like this. But I wanted to, like I said, change the paste and try to add some thermal pads and stuff. So this will just only get the heatsink of the IGS here. And this is two millimeter. I read two millimeter and one and a half on the internet, so I didn't know what exactly it was. I didn't try, but this is a two millimeter driver. Uh, it says here. So here they are, the funny ones. So they are like screws, but they're more like a pipe and a rivet. So it seems like they might actually be like screwing these things down and then riveting them, like flattening the heads here. But then we got them out in one piece, so we can actually reuse the stock cooler if we want to then. There was some paste there. So this is the IHS. Also I didn't like sneaky plan to use the thermal pad here. But yeah, this is the stock cooler. So let's start by cleaning this uh, IHS up. This is just... Uh, Beal Therma uh, electronic spray. It has some additives that really melts uh, the uh, paste. Really good when the paste is drying. So also, and also do the CPU here. Die here while we're at it. I think we're gonna scrape this a little bit. Because there is some kind of textile material in here. Nvidia likes to use those pads on RAM. I just use something, I know it's straight, so measuring tool. I don't know what to call it right now. But it's those things are straight, so. Basically, to put it one corner to another and look at the light source, like you know, the ceiling light, to see if there's any light coming through and where to figure out if it's flat or not. And this thing's fairly flat. And I checked. It's not easy to lap this thing, but uh, yeah. Because if it's quite uneven, you might have to resort to some form of thermal pad, high conductive ones, uh, something. Uh, Maybe something like a graphite uh, pad or something. Though those are highly conductive. And this is actually the heat I'm going to put on, and it has a pad here of some sort. It looks like graphite in the color, so I'm actually going to check if it's a conductive or not. Because uh, graphene, which is like two dimensional graphite, I think, is uh, all the rage nowadays. Oh, yes, that's highly conductive. So that is a graphite pad, probably. So extremely conductive. Uh, Thermo Grizzly makes that new pad. People tend to forget that those are conductive as hell, so probably not gonna use it because it's like damaged and so on. Uh, so probably gonna remove it. So now with these two apart and somewhat clean, uh, what we have to figure out is how much turbo pad the thickness we need here and over here for support. Like where this circle is, is a pretty good spot I think, just above it. Hopefully that shows up. A small gap. I'm gonna start with 0.5 millimeter and we'll see what happens with that. So let's put this pad on here. I 
There is still a protected layer on this side, a little bit uh, thick one, I think. Just gonna check first with that. Yeah, there's still way too thick, I think. Let me move that and see what happens. Yeah, I think we need like 0.25 because we still have a gap between the die. Because the thing is, we obviously removed uh, that uh, fabric in the middle there, which lowered the whole thing a little bit. So it did occur to me that I do actually have thermal tape. That's a little bit tricky though. I don't know how thick it is, but I think it's like 0.3 or something, which uh, might actually work better. Yeah, thickness 0 0.3. So. I think we can actually use that and we could actually, I think what we could do so it doesn't stick to both sides, we just take some thermal paste on something, uh, probably maybe the ships. We put it on here, the pad, grease it, that way we can check the gap again. I think this is the closest we're gonna get. But I think if you were to buy pads for this, I think 025 would be an option or get some really thick paste. So this indentation here is sitting somewhat higher than the cash ships. So I look from the side. So this this is probably gonna go here. That'd be good there. And then we put this one over here, just slightly below. So let's see how this works out, if it's a better solution. It's almost there, it's like a slight, uh, very slight gap here. So what I'm gonna do is remove this layer here. But like I said, 025 seems to be the pad size, the thickness you want. Sadly I don't have that. That will just go with some paste, I guess. But it has to be thick paste, or uh, term putty would be probably the ideal solution then. And some soft pads so they really do conform. Now we don't want this to stick. Get out some thermal paste here and intentionally make the double sided tape not be double sided anymore. It's gonna be quite hard to see here, but the gap is pretty much gone. Uh, I had to put a little bit of pressure here, which the springs are gonna do a lot more than that. And then it closes, and I can't actually see it now. I think uh, 0.3 works. I would ideally go with 0 0.25 pads. That seems to be, at least for this CPU, it would be ideal. So the next thing I kind of want to do is to put something here to keep this from not uh, tilting. So I got two pads, two millimeter each, and that's four millimeter. So that seems to be perfect over there. Just the slightest pressure and the gap on the die goes away. So we're basically ready to thermal paste the die and put this back together again, finally. Took a lot longer than I figured, but yeah, Intel over engineering. So I'm actually gonna put a little bit of paste on here. In this sheep of paste. Just gonna remove a little bit of paste. I don't want it to squeeze out everywhere. I'm gonna go with some MX4 paste here on the die. And then this thing is supposed to go like so. And I have prepared the clips again, so they should uh, snap into place, hopefully. So. 
Ideally, you want to put down both at the same time, but how are you going to do that? Mm. So holding that one almost down, and all the way, as long as, as far as I could. Yeah. And then that one, just to make the pressure as even as possible, not to crack the die, and yeah, not to push out the paste in one direction and so on. But I think we got it together. But you can see the supporting thermal pads over there. There is support. The whole thing doesn't tilt over here because the cash is pushing up here, for example. Uh, we even out as best as we could down to 0.005 millimeter. I think we were off the ideal measurement. But the cache should have cooling now. And I took an image of the cache. It seems to be 450 or 225 megahertz cache and the CPU runs the cache that has speed. So it seems to have the same cache as a Pentium 2 450, and this is a 400. So I think running 112 bus, which the motherboard support should work just fine. I know it posts because I tested that on before, but posting is one thing. So yeah, let's put the rest of the CPU together again. Now the question is, should we put some glue in here, or will they stick as well as before? Don't think the glue will stop me from getting in again. It's just gonna hold it together until I need to get in again, which I hope I never will. Because I hate these things. So yeah, basically what now we have is like a supposed retail CPU without the heatsink. So we can actually test mount this and just test run it and you know, see. You, you don't, we can run a little while without a heatsink if you just want to try it, so let's do that because I want to know if it works so I'm not wasting my time on uh, the heatsink and stuff. CPU is in the motherboard, we got the bench instead, we got a postcard and a uh, speaker and a uh, recap power supply and the power should be on. Uh, yeah, I know CMOS battery because I don't care, so let's try this. Got blue light. Yeah. Uh, this motherboard does not read any temperatures or RPMs as far as I can tell. A bit annoying. So I got my IR uh, thermometer out here. Got 27C, 16C inside roughly. Uh, 27.8. 28. So yeah, we didn't kill the CV at least. That's a good thing. And it seems to be working, so we're gonna move on uh, with the heatsink and fan. Before we mount the cooler, I want to have a fan for it because the original fan on the donated cooler is really bad. Like, it hardly runs, the bearings are completely ruined in this one. So, anyways, but I had this one, uh, it's, it's a used fan, but it's uh, fine. Uh, it's a sleeved one, I added some new grease to it just in case. So it runs fine. It's a little bit noisy. So we're gonna drop the RPM a little bit on it and uh, sleeve, uh, sleeve the cables and make it a little bit shorter. So we can a nice cable run. So you have to figure out like what resistor we want because this is, I don't remember the RPM. It's not that high, it's like 4800 or something. But the extra thickness uh, does help with moving it. So what I have done here is just hooked up this adapter here for a powering a lot of things and I've hooked up my lab power supply to these cables here so we can run it uh, like we did with the PSU fan and the previous video so I'm gonna set 12 volts here which is what we want for this fan and then run it so yeah a little bit noisy fan uh, but we can lower the RPM obviously so let's see there is 10 volts And there's 8 volts. That's kind of nice up there. It still moves a lot of air. These are 47 uh, ohm. 12 in. 7.80. Some, oh, 7.9 almost. But I think that's pretty, pretty good RPM. It's kind of cool more than enough. 
Så ja, det är så rätt där tror jag a half a half a watt so point twenty five. And I think we're gonna go with two of these in series. So this is these are twenty two. It's gonna give around eight volts then. So I'm just gonna splice the ground cables together here. So I got this leaving off some Nukta fan tank or adapter. So that's pretty quiet, 44 ohms. I don't know voltage, but it should be around 8 now. Before we mount the cooler to the actual CPU, you might see I've done something here and here. So what I forgot before, I should have checked, I had it in my mind. So we have something that is tabs, you have uh, threads. What usually happens with a screw and when you thread it is that it pulls material up. So put it in simple terms, uh, these holes here, the surrounding material is higher than the rest. I could have removed the material before with a drill bit or uh, there are special uh, bits for that. But uh, you can use a drill bit by hand. Now it would have been better to do this when the IGS was off so you don't get metal uh, flakes uh, on the CPU. But uh, I did it upside down basically like this uh, with the drill bit from behind, from below over uh, a trash can. So basically I already done it to all the four holes here. But that will take away the high spots like uh, from the threads. But it won't be enough. So I use a file. And once again it would have been easy to do this with uh, with uh, this IGS off. But I just held it upside down and then uh, basically file it. So yeah, I should have done this before but I forgot it. And you can hear take material away. So now that this, this silver circular is bigger than there. So if you do it until it starts to go easy, like you don't feel it take off material, like on these ones, then you're pretty much flat with the surrounding surface. And the reason I have to do this is because the heatsink is sitting like all, half a millimeter high or something. It's a, a nice little gap in between. Uh, and the thing I don't like with this kind of mounting is you can't really lap this heating. If you want to do that, you have to remove these uh, like centering studs, I suppose. I suppose you could remove them and make your own uh, that you can screw in or something, if you really want that. But anyways, I'm just gonna file these uh, flat. So I'm gonna test mount the heatsink here for flatness, so this should be good this way. Out on the sides there is a small gap. Really hard to show. Maybe I can get something in between. Yeah, so over here you can see what I mean. There's a small gap here. So this corner seems to be the worst gap. But it was a lot worse before. So if it's a heat sink or not, also a little bit there. But it gets stuck eventually, like 10 millimeters in. Yeah, 
but around the CP where the CP actually is, it's a uh, it's tight. I can't see any light, so I'm pretty happy with that. I don't think it's gonna get any better. So I don't want paste everywhere. So I'm gonna try to mask this thing off. A little bit might be overkill, but yeah. I figured I measured this, it's like 1.8 mm deep recession there. So I made this uh, 1.5 mm tall thermal pad. Probably completely overkill, but yeah, just to fill the gap here a bit. And then we can put paste on it. So I'll take a start here now. A lot of paste. So the reason why I want thermal paste all the way out is that you have this big IGS that is spreading heat all the way out. And then you're only using the middle of the heatsink to draw it out and not um, the sides out here. So that's also another thing I just find weird with this whole design. Let's now put this on the right way. It should be an arrow up. Yeah, yeah, last time we see this. Now squeeze out. So yeah, that is the heatsink mounted on the uh, CPU. It's time to mount the fan, but before we do that, some of you might have figured out that this fan won't fit because it's tall. This is 10 millimeter, this is 20. And these hooks here are supposed to hold the fan in place. And I figured out, well, I, what I did was basically I did push it in here. It's, you can still do that, it was sna not snap into anything. So, and then I basically used my knife, and this is a guide, and uh, made some markings here. Then I took the fan out again and filed the screw in here, on both sides. The rivets, or whatever it's called, I'll call them here, that holds uh, the locking mechanism in place, is touching the fan. But now it's in place. You can hear it snap, so it's not going anywhere now. It's like... So it locks in like that, as it's supposed to. I think it looks pretty cool now. Pretty beefy. So here we can actually mount this in the mount this thing, and yeah. Oh, we got some squeeze out there. It's probably coming out now as it's uh, settling into place. So I'm just gonna take a Q-tip and remove that. I think uh, disassembling and uh, repasting the CPU was uh, more than enough for one video. I was planning on uh, doing the motherboard instead, now that the graphics card had to be swapped. But uh, I probably spent close to six hours filming and uh, disassembling and putting the CPU back together again uh, with the new heatsink. I probably overdid it a bit, but uh, well, I like to... If you're gonna buy something or collect stuff and uh, service them you might as well get the most out of it so why do a five minute job if you can do a five hours i guess so the easier, easiest would just have been to remove the heat sink from the outside and try to do that safely and just uh, put another heat sink on but uh, that's not much fun 
But yeah, I think that's enough for this video. So the next one should be recapping the motherboard and then we have to go over the case a little bit and put everything together, I figure. So yeah, thank you for watching and have a nice day. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public lands when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.